about people who are so against abortion? Yes. Is it associated with religious fanaticism, with political conservatism? Yes. What's yes. the deal? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I was actually telling Whitney before. Um, one of one of my one of my favorite things to do is I read a lot of anti-choice literature. Um, I like to read a lot of pieces, either by the people who are involved in the movement or read pieces that were from the early days of the movement and such and so forth. And a lot of this comes from basically the. Most of what we know now is the National Right to Life Committee and the local state organizations and even the county and city organizations have come from inherently the Catholic Church. And the Catholic Church set up the apparatus that would eventually turn into the National Right to Life Committee before Roe v. Wade ever even happened and back when abortion was illegal because they knew that states were already starting to find ways to reform their own abortion laws. So before Roe, they had already set up these individual um, city and church-based groups that that would become the backbone of what is now the National Right to Life Committee. And the idea is that, well, the idea is really simple, and it's that people honestly believe that. They, I like to try and divide the 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 pro-life movement and I'm going to call it pro-life purposely right now, into two categories. And you have the pro-life people and you have the anti-choice people. Pro-life people are the people that would say, you know, I would not have an abortion. I don't believe that people should have abortion as a form of birth control. I, but once you start talking to them about individual circumstances, so for instance, they'll say, I don't think abortion should be used as birth control, but I think that it's okay if a woman is raped. Um, those are pro-life people. The difference between that and anti-choice is that an anti-choice person believes that in order to, they're not just against abortion, they're against birth control as well, and they're against what they call a birth control mentality and a contraceptive mentality. And you'll often see them writing about this and talking about it and saying that people are contracepting. And the idea of contracepting is this mindset that it's a sex outside of marriage, um, it's a sex without the purpose of trying to procreate and it basically absolves you of a responsibility that is supposed to come to you from having sex. So in an ideal world there would be abstinence only education for them. Um, you would only have sex once you were married. If you had sex before you were married and you got pregnant then there are two options. You would get married or you would have to give birth. You would have birth and give away the baby to a good couple who could give it a better life than you would have. The giving birth part is really important and it's important because when you are pregnant you serve as a warning that this is what happens if you have sex. Um, it's not that pregnancy is a punishment in itself, it's that pregnancy is a way of showing, showing sin. And so if you have an abortion, then you can basically absolve both the sin of having sex and, and sh not show the resulting sin of that sex. Pregnancy is a badge of showing that you did something wrong. Um, and that wrong was having sex outside of marriage. So it's not even just that we need to protect every fertilized egg and make sure that it is born to complete fruition. It's the idea that if that fertilized egg is, doesn't turn into a pregnancy or if somehow that egg gets out and doesn't get fertilized because, because you were using a condom or if you didn't ovulate in time, you got away with something. You got away with this act of having sex without showing what the sin is of is having this the sex. the woman's responsibility? Oh yeah, of course. Entirely. Of course. <laughs> um, I mean, men shouldn't have sex outside of marriage. Men shouldn't have sex without the intent of producing children, but... <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that's, I mean, that's a lot of what you'll, you'll hear if you talk to the biblical manhood people who Todd and I were talking about this at dinner. Biblical manhood is a really big thing because it's a way of controlling women. And it's a way of saying, okay, 
you are the head of your family and that makes you the God in your family and the ultimate authority and then you are underneath God the ultimate authority there and when you have that sort of mindset there isn't really much of a room for a legislature or a president or anything like that it's the ultimate authority comes down God husband who's patriarch of family and then the family and then the family replicates this over and over again so that's why you'll see a lot of why is the government getting involved in my birth control because the government as a mechanism for bringing birth control into these families and allowing sex to happen in this non-traditional way is stepping in not just in allowing in allowing sex to come outside of marriage but in stepping in its authority and replacing the authority of the father in in these relationships is that making sense yeah, the Catholic Church has lost a lot of credibility with American Catholics, even. Uh, if yes. you were to say where this, these two branches of abortion mm -hmm. uh, restriction come from, uh, the anti-sex sounds more Calvinist to me. Uh, the pro-life pro sounds like more directly from Catholicism. Um, I think that what happened is there was kind of a point in which the two merged and it merged right about, and this is where we start getting into like really modern religion theory, um, Francis Schaeffer when he and C. Everett Koop basically kind of started the evangelical movement, revitalized the evangelical movement as it were and moved them from kind of waiting for the end times to come about and move them into an idea of active participation in daily government and trying to create their own their own paradise on earth while they waited for the world to end. Um, that's when, because before that, the evangelicals weren't involved in any way, shape, or form really in the idea of debating abortion, well, in a lot of politics in general. But Francis Schaeffer helped to bring them in and helped them make make nice with the Catholics and they work together and that's how they formed what what became our modern Christian right and so the fact that they kind of have embraced each other a little bit and taken in some of each other's worldviews makes sense because they found that abortion um, school choice for sure and and the idea of of homosexuality as, as something that must be fought against and traditional Christian values must be upheld. This was a good place for the two of them to kind of clasp hands and become become comrades and work together. And I mean since then their cloud has been pretty amazing. One of the things that we are seeing though is that a lot of religious groups are trying to get back get back some of the lost power that they've lost to the elders of, of, of the like you see the nuns on the bus fighting the Catholic, the the Council of Bishops. You'll see um, more of the like the Methodist and the Unitarians are really coming into their own and trying to bring back the religious idea of because before Roe, before Roe, when abortion was illegal, religious consulting clergy were the people who helped women find access to safe legal abortions. Um, Religious leaders, until until <laughs> this marriage between the higher up Catholics and the evangelicals, religious leaders, a lot of them found that abortion really was a civil rights issue, and they treated it as such, and they thought that it wasn't fair that women didn't have bodily autonomy, and that this was something that would affect more women of color and women who are poor and women in rural areas. So there's Catholics for Choice, and there's um, Faith Aloud, and all of these groups that are now trying to both remind people of the history of their own movement and that religion wasn't always the enemy when it came to reproductive rights. It's just that at this point, so much of the Catholic, the Catholic hierarchy, and it's not the Catholic people, it's the Catholic hierarchy, and so much of the more even it's not even the evangelicals themselves but the charismatic evangelicals those churches and especially the reformed lutheran churches um the really it's not reformed lutheran i'm saying the wrong church but anyway so the the really the really far right evangelicals um 
they're the loud ones on this issue. And in a lot of ways, publicly, they're very powerful on this issue, but they're not the voice on this issue. There are so many religious voices that don't agree with what's going on and that really are trying to find a way to work their voices back into the mainstream and make people especially understand that spirituality and believing in reproductive freedom do not have to be too far apart from each other. That you can be, you can be religious, you can believe in bodily autonomy, um, abortion isn't the taking of a life. It isn't the murder that, that the Catholic Church believes it is. And there are ways that everybody can work back together to kind of join together the, the more liberal sides of the church. You know, one of the things that was really interesting working on this book is we did it very quickly. Um, it's not even a year old yet. We pitched the idea in June. We wrote it in a couple of weeks. Um, we edited it. We tried to keep it as up to date as possible, which even then, with the like month and a half that it was at the printer, tsh, then everything happened. <laughs> Need I mention North Dakota? North Dakota kind of threw the whole book off. Um, but one of the things in looking at all of these laws is every single law in the book, these are the grandfather laws, these are the model legislations that are being passed in a lot of different states and are being proposed in pretty much every state. But this all happened because of the 2010 election and every bill that's in this book was proposed after 2010 and it was proposed after that because with the Tea Party wave we had so many states that had not just their house and their senate but also their governor's mansion taken over by the Republican Party which added, made this perfect environment for these bills to be proposed and passed. Including this one. Including this one. Well and Wisconsin, like one of the things that I talk about in the book is Every law that passed in Wisconsin was proposed in Minnesota. It was just each one of them was vetoed by Mark Dayton. The most powerful role in state government in many cases can be the governor. Um, but this was all because of a wave and these have all happened since 2010. That's just a couple of years. All we need is the right circumstances, the right election, the right, I mean, redistricting probably has screwed us a lot, but there's not a lack of hope. We need to get the right people into the government. We definitely need to get the right people into the judiciary because the judiciary is becoming more and more powerful and unfortunately more and more politicized. Um, the right people running for office. We've seen a lot of these bills in really conservative states get stopped because enough people have showed up at the state houses and really fought them. Um, one of the most, one of the best examples, and I'm gonna mess up whether, I wanna say it's Idaho, but it might've been Utah. I'm pretty sure it's Idaho though. Idaho had a mandatory ultrasound bill show up and it was a given. It went through the Senate, um, passed in a heartbeat. As soon as it passed, one of the things that we were told was that we should just start focusing straight on the governor and try and get him to veto it because that was our only hope. We were paying attention to that, but the activists on the ground and people who weren't activists, they went to the state house. They sent petitions, they did candlelight vigils. That bill never ended up getting voted in the House and they do not have a mandatory ultrasound bill because people on the ground really rallied and this is one of the most conservative states in the country. They didn't get locked out either. No. <laughs> yeah. True. Yeah. You guys, <laughs> you do your best when you rally but man. <laughs> but see you, I mean, even that though, like the amount of attention that you guys got when you were the don't say vagina, my god. like. Everybody was paying attention to you, and you have so much power to get the media to pay attention. And the media was paying attention in Idaho. Um, that was the um, uh, Chuck Winder said something about how if a woman came in and said she was raped, that hopefully a doctor would be able to give her a test to make sure that she. And he said that he meant that like some sort of dating test to make sure that it was really a product of rape and not a product of her. No, it wasn't. It was a rape test. You were saying, you know, check and make sure she was really saying she was raped because that's a big deal in the anti-choice movement is this idea that you can't have a rape exception because every woman is going to come in and claim that she was raped because women lie, women lie, women lie when they go on something. So, but these are tools that we can use to fight. Um, and even states like Minnesota, these blue states that have built, well, Minnesota frankly needs to try a lot harder, but that's for another, that's for another talk. Um, states like New York, where they're looking at the Reproductive Parity Act, 
Washington has tried twice now to pass a Reproductive Parity Act. It keeps getting stuck. Um, it looks like it's stuck again this year. But the point is that really blue states like this, California is doing a lot to try and improve abortion access as well. It, it They already have good access. These states already have good access. But when they keep proposing laws that will offer, get more birth control out there, get more people who can provide abortions, um, those sort of laws make it obvious how crazy abortion at the point of fertilization laws are or how how utterly to the right the idea of letting everybody and their mother cut off your access to contraception it becomes it becomes such a vast difference that it starts to move the discussion back in the other direction so there's a lot of things that we really had to be excited about it's not all doom and gloom yeah. I'm concerned about the lack of what I would call stand-up men. Ugh. The right to life movement is uh, has uh, is dominated by male yep. viewpoints and males have power in the society. They get more attention, they get more time on the Sunday talk shows. All of the things that make it possible for their point of view to take place. We seem to have a group of equivocators. <laughs> Progressive men have not been as vocal as they need to be. And Most of some the of them have been as progressive as they need to be. Absolutely. Obama. Yes, indeed. What do we do about that? That is an excellent question. Um, we have a writer over on RH Reality Check that I've become a really big fan of. He's pretty young. His name is Andrew Jenkins, and he's helping to push the bro choice movement. Um, <laughs> It, I know that he's striking chords because the biblical manhood people are totally after him. They hate bro choice. They think it's awful. Um, I think that a lot of men don't get as involved simply because they feel that they're kind of pushed out of the movement in some ways. Um, that's something that we really need to work on because Oh, obviously we need allies in, in a lot of ways. Um, and unfortunately, until we can find a way to fix our unequal political system and convince more women that they need to run for office and find ways to get more people to vote for women when they do run for office, we need male allies. And frankly, at this point, men are gonna get up into higher office faster than women are. And there's just not anything that we can do immediately about that. So, I don't know. I, I try to figure out what is, is seen as alienating. I think it's hard. It's hard to figure out what, what to do to make men both feel comfortable in the movement. Well, actually, I don't think they have a problem feeling comfortable in the movement except when we try and push them out of it. <laughs> um, and we do do quite a bit of that, which we shouldn't. Um, part of the problem is the fact that it's not even just a male versus female issue, it's a how do you raise activists issue. And that's something that has become really, a really big question to me now that my daughter's in Catholic school. Um, yeah, shock face. It's, it's not entirely... Is she going to get membership in the KKK soon too? No, no. Or maybe. She's in, she's Catholic school. She's in Catholic school because for anybody who has young children, they understand how ridiculously expensive childcare is. Ridiculously uh. expensive. And I have three small children, and two of them cannot go to school. She's the oldest. The other two are both in a very good daycare, but daycare is really, really expensive. She's not going to be in Catholic school, obviously, over the summer. She's going to be in daycare, and at that point, I'm going to be paying almost $1,000 a week for three children in daycare. Mm. That's the problem. Your options are a really expensive daycare or something that is going to be funded by a church organization. There's no way around it. There really aren't. I mean, we've seen we've seen legislators cut Head Start. We've seen legislators cut even just basic basic daycare, any sort of daycare subsidies, anything like that. So isn't that a failure of the secular movement then? Because if you look at humanism and you look at atheists, agnostics, 20% nowadays are non-believers. Right. They haven't built any social infrastructure. I mean, that's one of my concerns. And that's, the that's the problem because they look in many ways at, when you hit the secular side of things, they think that the government's an ally, which the government can't be a path to that. Um, it's going back to the crisis pregnancy center um, story that I was talking about earlier, that it, it was a fantastic article in Cutter Lines, and I really recommend that everybody go and read it. Um, that discusses 
on the one side people see the pro-choice movement as being uh, okay you have an unplanned pregnancy here's your ability to get an abortion um, and then the antithesis is the religious based crisis pregnancy center that says okay here are the rewards that you will get if you do this prayer and come to this prayer group and and such and so forth. So everything that they hold out, they're holding out on the one side to make her decide that she's going to carry to term, but it all comes with strings. And those strings are, you have to do these religious things and be involved in our organization because they're just as interested in her soul as they are in the baby's soul. Um, what Anib An Anibba, I think her name, Ak Akimba, what Akimba wrote about is this organization that was starting in St. Louis that was a crisis pregnancy center for for the unwanted, uh, for lack of a better way of putting it. Um, it's deep in the inner city. It's and it addresses women that regular crisis pregnancy centers aren't likely to. Um, one of them was one of the stories was helping a woman who was expecting and already had two children find housing, which was difficult for her to do because she was a, she was a former felon. And it was like she had stolen something from Walmart when she was 19. I mean, it's the sort of thing that, why is this still on your record? But a crisis pregnancy center, which has the ability to pick and choose what who they want to help, is not going to help you with that. Crisis pregnancy centers, as they should exist, to me, are a fantastic idea. And I think are something that we should be funding. Um, they should come with no strings attached. You get help because you need help. Um, we will help you with to get through your pregnancy. We will help you with that child afterwards. Crisis pregnancy centers, in essence, are a, a basic extension of government help, which, as simply government help, obviously the right is is very adamantly against. Um, but when you take it and you put these religious strings attached to it and allow discrimination and allow picking and choosing who you're going to help, then because they're using their church money for it, it's all okay. Um, so that's kind of how I see the secular movement, if that makes sense. The secular movement should be doing that crisis pregnancy center that's going to help everybody and shouldn't be trying to go through the government to do it. Um, but because we think that the government sh is going to help pr make provide in these instances, we go and we work within the government to do it, and uh, I'm starting to think that's not the right path. And that is so much a bigger movement than I can handle at this moment. I'm still trying to get people birth control. <laughs> um, can I jump in there for a minute? Because I, yes, I am sort of one of the leaders of the secondary movement yeah. nationally. Um, your critique is exactly right. Although it's being heard and things really are starting to change. Uh, we have organizations like the Foundation Beyond Belief, which I do some work with, uh, do some media work with. Um, we're about to go over a million dollars in grants given to you know, local organizations who do this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, we're starting to realize as a secular movement that it isn't enough just to you know, write critiques of religion. It isn't enough to just say, well, the Bible's stupid. You have to build uh, an infrastructure to provide a lot of the things that religious organizations do provide. Um, and, and we have some, some roadmaps for that because you know, a lot of, as, 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 uh, as Robin was saying, a lot of the things that, um, that have gone on in terms of fighting for social justice have been based in religion many times. It isn't just that religion is the big bad evil, prevent women from having their rights. There's a lot of people in you know, the Catholic Church, nuns, for example, who really fight for that sort of thing. We need to, re we need to be building the same thing. And there's a lot of people in the secondary movement, a lot of organizations that are moving exactly in that direction. So I think um, that's something that you're going to see over the next decade really start to, to blossom. It is going beyond just not just critiquing religion, but really building infrastructure and building organizations that actually do something. You know, the, the Foundation Beyond Belief, our, our, our sort of mantra is putting humanist principles into action. And is it enough just to write about them? You've got to actually get out there and help somebody. Um, and the other thing I want to say really quickly, as, as a, a male ally of all this, I've never felt pushed out or uncomfortable any more than I have in you know, the gay rights movement, where uh, as a straight ally, you know, I, I've never felt anything but welcome. So. You're welcome to me. <laughs> well, I've never had anybody say otherwise. Everybody's always, you know, happy for the help, you know. So. I actually have two questions that sort of follow up on both of those. The first one is, what role is 
you know, the choice movement in a lot of ways is, is framed around feminism. Mm -hmm. So what role is, for those of us who are male allies, you know, I have no problem speaking out and I never have, but I know a lot of progressive men who feel very strongly about choice, but don't feel that they have the power to speak out because doing so is stepping on a woman and her, her right to speak out. And I think inherently there might be a little more of a welcoming, not attitude per se, but a, a bigger niche or there's a, a, not a switch per se, but there's a lot more focus on what we're calling reproductive justice these days. And I saw Loretta Ross speak and she's amazing and if you ever have a chance to see her go see her speak and she, one of the best parts of her speech was she explained the elevator pitch for reproductive justice and the elevator pitch for reproductive justice is it's the right to have a child it's the right to not have a child and it's the right to raise that child in a safe and healthy environment and that is something that i think re resonates not just with women but also with men that men also want the right to have a child, to not have a child, and to raise that child in a safe and healthy environment. It's not a gender specific issue thing in any way, in the same way that choice is. And I think that with the reproductive justice movement, um, frankly, the words reproductive justice just sound so... I know a lot of, especially younger activists, get very excited by it because choice sounds kind of benign and so it feels like there's some sort of action really being taken but i'm not sure if i would like the words reproductive justice just because it's a little too superhero-y but i do like the elevator message and the fact that it's open not just to women or not even just to men but to people of all gender people of all sexuality um it's open to everyone because everyone always has the same issues have a child not have a child raised in a safe environment the other thing that I would point out is, in hearing the discussion about crisis pregnancy centers and, and access to care and aftercare, I'm reminded of how aid service organizations have developed a medical model that actually does all of that, and in many instances is, is helping that woman who's HIV positive, who's gotten pregnant, to find that housing, to deal with the, the criminal stuff. Is there any conversation between the choice movement and the HIV and AIDS service organizations about creating cooperative models that, that you're aware of? I would, that I'm aware of, no, but that's just because my job is to track legislation. Um, does that happen? I'm, this, I hope so. I, if, God, I hope so. <laughs> Going back to the crisis pregnancy centers, one of the most popular bills that we're seeing across the country now is the idea of no taxpayer funding for abortion and that they're stretching no taxpayer funding for abortion to unbelievable lengths. Um, one, of the, one of the things that's happening right now in Ohio, hey Ohio, is that they're considering a bill that will say that you cannot provide a transfer agreement or admitting privileges if you are a hospital that accepts any sort of public funding. So if you are associated with a university, if you are a basic medical hospital, basically anything that is not a non a for profit hospital, a for profit hospital is not gonna offer admitting privileges to a doctor because they're gonna they're gonna get picketed, it's it's not gonna happen. And then what a Catholic hospital is gonna offer? No, that's not gonna happen either. And then without these admitting privileges, clinics are gonna close. Um, since we're seeing no taxpayer funding of XXX stretching so much, what I would like to see is a no taxpayer funding of crisis pregnancy centers. Um, I think it's a model legislation that could be easily written. I don't have the ability to write model legislation. I like to think that somebody can. Um, if anybody is listening, <laughs> write a model bill. Um, because we see places like CareNet that will start to build a new building and ask for for specialized funding and low low wage government loans. Um, we see in Missouri that that there well Minnesota has Positive Alternatives Act which gives taxpayer funds straight to crisis pregnancy centers so that they can help provide alternatives to abortion. We've they don't really have any sort of accounting for the this money. We there's just this okay XXX dollars were sent 
X goes to client services, X goes to overhead, etc. But it doesn't say what these actually were spent on. I mean, these must be like thousand dollar car seats that they're buying if they're actually spending these on clients. If we could pass something like that, or if we are can't do it, if we can say, okay, so crisis pregnancy centers are getting taxpayer funding, so why can't we use taxpayer funding and also put off a portion to go to this non-religiously based help a woman through her pregnancy and, and settle her after she's had her baby? There's no reason why we can't use the government, because obviously they're using the government. We should be able to get taxpayer funding for something that works for us, too. Well, I think originally it was a separation of church and state. They should be getting government funding. For oh, they are. Church organizations, and I think that's what has to be pulled back. Yeah, and. Obama's not gone on that. No, know. and I mean, as we're looking, I mean, so many of the crisis pregnancy centers that exist now have been funded even in cases where there is supposed to be that that line between church and state have been funded through abstinence only education grants that i mean how many administrations now in a row have had faith-based initiatives we know that money is going to and i'm it's not necessarily bad all the time. I mean, in crisis pregnancy centers, yes, because they're telling people that there's huge holes in their condoms and they'd be better off just not having sex with anything whatsoever. And that, I don't know, abortion makes you sterile and everything else. And then they give you a little ultrasound that, are you gonna have an abortion? Okay, here's an ultrasound with your little baby and it says, hi mommy, over the top of it. I mean, it's basic, it's not just, bad medicine, it's emotional manipulation, and that, we're funding that, and how can that be okay? You mentioned the abstinence only. I have long had a fear. I, I just was wondering where you're going with that statement. Yeah, I, I'm not, um, you know, this isn't original mm -hmm. to me, but I've been making this argument for years that the, the anti-choice movement is not really about abortion at all. That's just, that's just the foot in the door. Yeah. Ultimately, the, 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 the goal is contraception. Uh, and punishing women for being sexual. Yes. Period. You know, because if they really wanted, if it was all about abortion, they, they would, would be handing out condoms like candy. Yes. But they're against doing that too. So it's not really, it's not about stopping abortion, it's and, about punishing women. And people don't understand that. And that's one of the reasons why one of the things that I've been working on so much in the last year is my series on REH Reality Check, which is They're Coming for Your Birth Control. And it is a constant litany of all the different things that religious right leaders or even people in the government have said explaining that you know they do not believe that you should have access to birth control. One of the last ones was um, Randall Terry was just on MTV because Randall Terry and MTV who could resist. It was one of those um, MTV My True Life um, reality shows and it was and I'm not kidding the title of the episode was My True Life, I Hate the Government. <laughs> um, and the, the episode, go and find it on their website. It's really a great episode. Um, the It shows a Tea Party high schooler who is trying to start his, his own Tea Party club in California at his high school. He's like 16 and really rich. Um, so he's going to come out in about four years. <laughs> and then there is a woman in Florida who is trying to, who is a member of the militia and is trying to convince militias that they should join together to become a lobbying group, which is really funny because apparently when, when you tell militias that they should get together and work together, they assume that you're an FBI plant, so, yeah. <laughs> so, so they pretty much came after her. Um, and then it, Andrew, I think his name was Andrew Beecham, and Andrew Beecham is one of Randall T Terry's followers when Randall Terry went to his crazy, I'm going to help people run for office so that they can run campaign ads on television with bloody aborted fetuses. Um, and so he, actually this guy ended up <laughs> trying to challenge Boehner <laughs> for, <laughs> for his house seat, but he didn't manage to get onto the ballot in time. But because he was on the MTV special, Randall Terry was over at the house all the time and talking. And one of the things that Randall Terry said as they were starting to put together one of their commercials was, do we want an abortion? Yes. 
Do we want to ban birth control? Yes. Do we want to ban emergency contraception? Yes. Do we want to ban the IUD? Yes. Do we want to ban the birth control pill, condoms? Yes. Do we want to put women in jail for using them? Yes. I'm like, thank you. <laughs> That's all I needed. This is what they're saying. It's just not everybody is so blatantly obvious about it as Randall Terry. This is what they want. The most dangerous place to be is between Randall Terry and a TV camera. Yeah, no kidding. I saw I saw some other documentary that he was doing with this with this lesbian talk show host, and <laughs> and I just saw no, it's, it's it's called Randall Terry and Me. I don't know if it's out yet. I just saw the trailer for it, but yeah, Randall Terry will do pretty much anything for a camera.